Thank you. Uh, yeah, so uh, I, what I would like to talk about is I think now we have a much better understanding of certain things which sort of uh, have been puzzling for some time. And uh, well, as um, we all know, uh, the, a lot of success of machine learning has been based on models uh, and training algorithms, which are extraordinarily complex. It is not very easy to get uh, some sort of idea of what are the key components underlying that success. And now, at least, I think we can identify one part of that. And that's um, the idea of interpolation, which Peter already talked about a little bit in the beginning. I'll talk more about this. So I'll talk about interpolation and its consequences. <coughs> now, uh, if you sort of look at the classical setting for supervised machine learning, and you see that uh, the goal of machine learning algorithm sort of in the classical statistical setting, imagine that I have data and I'm assuming that it's sample ID from some distribution and so on, then uh, I would like to find an algorithm whose output is essentially the best possible predictor and the best possible predictor is given by the expected, the minimizing the expected value of an unseen data of some loss function. So that's kind of the goal of machine learning is to find, well, given data, of course, something close to this F star. Now, what do we do in practice? Well, in practice, we use some version of algorithmic empirical risk minimization. We take a family of functions, for example, neural networks, and over that, using, uh, say, stochastic gradient descent, that's what's typically done, we find, we try to minimize the loss over the training data. Okay, so that's the empirical risk, and this is a kind of true or expected risk. So if this output is close to this one, we're done, right? That's great. And then the question is, um, well, wouldn't it be reasonable to assume that if we want these two things to be the same, then the corresponding objective function should also be the same? Well, uh, if you look at sort of classical generalization bounds, they're all of the following form. You, you can call them vizy week. What you see is what you get. Because what you get is the expected risk. And in most of the bounds that we have, it's bounded by the empirical risk. What is the empirical risk? It's this quantity. And how does a bound work? Well, you have the expected risk, which is smaller than the empirical risk, plus some sort of a complexity term, typically something like square root of C over N, when C is some measure of complexity of the problem. And the idea is that as N increases, these two things converge, and you get the same output. Now, how does this depend on this complexity term C? Well, if you, again, if you look at this classical type of um, analysis, they're based on the bias variance trade-off, which is the idea that as the model complexity increases, you, well, when the model complexity is low, you have underfitting. When the model complexity is high, you have overfitting. Your empirical loss is low, but your expected loss is high. And the goal of machine learning is to find a model which is somewhere in the middle of that U shape. The textbook corollary of that is that a model with zero training error is overfit to the training data and will generalize poorly. And we will call this interpolation just because mathematically that's what interpolation is. OK, now uh, an example from uh, the paper Understanding Deep Learning Requires Rethinking Generalization. They train the standard architecture of a neural network. They get 100% accuracy. The test accuracy is quite good, right? It's about 90%. So it looks like there is no penalty here for overfitting. That seems to contradict what I just showed you before, though, those classical bounds. Well, it doesn't quite contradict this on its own. It's very suggestive. But you can say, well, what maybe test accuracy should be 100%, right? Then the, the bounds would apply. It's just a little bit loose here. 
So let me show an experiment that we did, which is much more extreme than that. And this is um, with my students, Suan Ma and Sumik Mandal. Uh, we did the following experiments. You take MNIST, it's a 10 class problem, of course, so uh, you, when you, so you randomize a fixed percentage of the labels, so you take, uh, sorry, of the data. So you take, say, 60% of your data, of the training data, and you assign to that random labels. And then you use, uh, say, kernel machine, say, Laplace kernel, to fit the data exactly, and by fitting it exactly, it has essentially numerically zero L2 loss. Well, something like 10 to the minus 27. So this is the maximum amount of overfitting which is numerically possible. Now, uh, you can see that, uh, you know, if the output, if, you know, you had the best possible predictor, you can never beat this noise level. So the green line here is the base optimal, which is the best optimal predictor. Now, of course, well, 90% is a random chance because it's a 10 class problem. So you can see that um, even for very high noise levels, these predictors, including neural network, Gaussian kernel, are quite far from random noise and only a little bit worse than the optimal predictor. So there is no penalty for kind of overfitting penalty. There is this kind of benign overfitting. Uh, even when you interpolate, even when you interpolate with zero loss. Now, uh, if this some sort of uh, strange uh, phenomenon, the argument is that it's not. That's actually the practice of deep learning, at least as described by the practitioners. Uh, so Ruslan, in fact, gave a talk here uh, two years ago in the program on deep learning, and his tutorial, uh, he described how to train neural networks, and he said, well, the best way to solve the problem is to get zero training error. That may be not the end of it. You do other things after that. But even with that, you already get good result. And that's, at the very least, that's the first step toward it. So in a sense, what machine learning does now is to start with interpolation. So if we don't understand interpolation, the argument goes, well, it would be very difficult to understand how, how deep learning works. Now, I should point out, this is really not a completely new phenomenon. And uh, Leo Breiman wrote uh, some years ago, wrote a note, Reflections After Referring Papers for NIPS. And he asked several questions. The first one, why don't heavily parameterized neural network overfit the data? And, uh, well, I don't know if you can guess when it was written. 95. <laughs> well, 20 years later, uh, Jan Lekun, actually, la just last year, he said deep learning breaks some basic rules of statistics, presumably based on some of the similar kind of observations. So I think now we can resolve this issue. And finally, we can sort of reconcile statistics with this type of phenomenon. OK, so what is the plan for the talk? Uh, first, I will talk about statistical theory of interpolation, showing that we actually have some methods which are statistically valid and interpolate the data. That's number one. Two, I will discuss the landscape of machine learning, and in particular, a phenomenon we call the double descent, which kind of combines the U curve and what we observe in modern models. And three, I'll very briefly talk about optimization because I think this is really crucial part of why the things work. Okay, so let's start with the first. Let me point out why classical. Let me just uh, narrow down this argument a little bit why classical bounds have difficulty with us. Because, well, what, what happens with a classical bound when your empirical risk is zero? This term disappears completely. So the expected risk must be bounded completely by the model complexity. And uh, therefore, what we need, we need to basically have a bound in terms of this. Well, uh, what would that mean? If you look at the figure I showed before, suppose you look at something like 70% noise level. That means that you need to bound this red line between the green line and the dashed uh, horizontal line. Well, um, 
what you would need, therefore, for the bound is square root of c of a n over n. Well, there are other ways to write this, but this is kind of a typical one, to be between 0.7 and 0.9. So that's what you want. You want it to be correct, which means that it has to be bigger than 0.7, which is an optimal one. It has to be smaller than 0.9, because otherwise it's trivial, right? It's worse than noise. And you have to keep this as n goes to infinity. The problem with this, we don't have any bound of this form. We don't have any reason to think that they exist. There are some reasons that at least bounds of certain type don't exist, like, like that. And moreover, a constant factor of two, a multiplicative factor of two, would invalidate any bound like this. It has to be exact, no, not like exact up to a constant. So if this doesn't work, what do we have? Well, let's just go very quickly over some analysis that we have and see what can explain interpolation and then what cannot, rather, and then what can. So VCD mentioned rather market complexity type of bound cannot because of this. And what is happening is that you know, you have the training loss is equal to zero. It's not equal to the expected loss. That also applies to other types of bounds. Regularization type analysis like Tikhon of an early stopping has similar form. That's a slight simplification, but essentially the same. Um, algorithmic stability also has this. So none of these bounds really can be hoped to work. However, there is a different type of bounds, which are classical smoothing bounds and you know, the Raya Watson type of uh, result, which is, uh, kind of parse and windows or kernel smoothing, there are different names for that. Um, this result in oracle bounds, and by oracle I mean that the expected loss is approximately equal to the optimal loss. That can work because there is no reason that this, none, none of that is zero. Of course, these bounds are kind of less satisfactory because we don't observe expected loss, we don't observe the optimal loss. So it's like bounding something which we don't observe to something else which we don't observe. Okay, that's maybe, this is nicer, but this doesn't work. So really, most classical analysis, even though in principle they could, they don't support interpolation. However, there is one really famous, and everybody knows that example, it's one nearest neighbor classifier. One nearest neighbor classifier, um, <coughs> very suggestive. It's interpolated classifier, it has a non-trivial classical bound, which to say that it's twice bounded by twice, its loss is bounded, uh, its risk is bounded by twice the base risk. And its analysis is not based on this type of complexity bounds. It's a completely different type of analysis. And so there is no reason something like that cannot work. And um, now I'm going to give you an example of something which is very much motivated by one nearest neighbor. Yeah, Why is the base risk in the example that you gave? It's, it's Pretty bad, yeah? Pretty bad, yeah, yeah. So you want something like that, but much better, exactly. Yeah. For Rademacher, why don't I just pick a norm-based bound where the norm scales with n? Well, it would be very difficult because if your constant is wrong by a factor of two, you're dead. No, I don't mean I don't mean prove. I mean just derive a norm-based bound and then evaluate the norm on your data. And what if it's you know, what if in principle you could, but it we don't know any examples of this. And again, if your constant is off, it's not going to work. So you have to get the constant exact within like. It has to be one plus epsilon. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a stronger um, opposition to that, right? Because you could condition on the data and use those arguments to talk about what the uh, conditional expectations say and why at each xi looks like. And, and this sort of bound can't possibly be true because you're, you're predicting yi, which is wrong. Which is, right. you know, that, that's right. also that, that's kind of the philosophically, yeah, Not right. Philosophically. Even even you are saying even mathematically, that case, right? Right, right. But maybe there is some other bound which goes well. In any case, yeah. Uh, okay, but let, let me just I'll discuss only I'll, I'll discuss one uh, kind of algorithm of this form in. Uh, this is joint work with Daniel and uh, with Part Dmitry, and also there is a follow-up with uh, Sasha Rocklin and Sasha Tsibakov. Um, so here, here is the idea. So it's kind of like a kernel smoothing method, except you're using a singular kernel. And the singular kernel has this form. So it's essentially one of a distance. You can just think of this as being one of a distance. Now, one of a distance has a singularity, and you think, well, okay, this is not going to work. But actually, if you multiply 
y i is pi the kernel, and you divide it by the sum, the singularity cancels out, and you get something which is continuous. It's continuous, but it's not smooth. It doesn't have any derivatives at the singularity point. So what you see is something like that. I'll describe this a little bit more in a second. And the interesting thing is that you can show that this strange algorithm actually is not just consistent for both classification and regression, but in a sense it's statistically optimal in a certain minimum sense. Now, let me just point out the kind of um, implication of that. Well, so imagine my data are just, it's one dimensional, it's linear plus noise. Now, this algorithm is going, this is an example of this, is going to fit the data exactly. So at every data point, you are very far from the blue line, which is the optimal predictor. We know that blue line is optimal. So it looks like I'm doing terribly. But actually, if you take a random point from this interval, you're doing just fine. So somehow you're doing very badly on your data, but you're doing just fine at a point chosen at random from the interval. That's a sort of very counterintuitive aspect of this. And apparently this is what's happening in many of the algorithms in practice. Okay, one um, quick implication of this. I, uh, adversarial examples, right? So uh, probably everyone knows you take an image, it's a dog, you add some noise to it, which is not visible, very tiny amount, it becomes an ostrich, right? Uh, well, here is a theorem that you can prove if, um, and in fact, Peter also mentioned the similar uh, related aspect of this. Um, if you have label noise, then your adversarial examples are going to be asymptotically dense. So you would expect to see an adversarial example in the neighborhood of every point. I'm not saying this is the only way by which this kind of examples appear, and probably not. We, we, there are other reasons they may appear. But I think this suggests that if you take an interpolation seriously as a way to train those models, and that seems to be the way that it's done in practice, then you shouldn't be surprised when you get something like that. The math actually suggests that you would have that. So okay, so now. Uh, so you say that the sensitivity that we sell is a payment that we pay for interpolating in practice? Yeah. yeah. That seems good. Okay, so now uh, let me sort of. So, what have I shown so far? So, I have given some results showing the empirical validity of interpolation in particular for those experiments for neural nets and kernel machines. And I've shown the statistical validity interpolation. There are some rules which are optimal and interpolate. However, um, there is a disconnect here, right? And what is a disconnect? Well, the problem is that the first one is ERM and the second one is really non-ERM. Those rules are of a different type. And in particular, it's not clear how generalization is affected by model complexity. Where, do, where does this complexity come in? Because those nearest neighbor rules, they don't actually have a notion of complexity as such. So that's um, kind of the next stage. And that's what, where we were actually like about like a year ago. Like th that was very unclear. I think now we understand the connection. No, not necessarily full theoretical analysis, but we understand how the connection works. Uh, so if you look at the classical risk curve, and uh, this is joint work with uh, Daniel and uh, and Ma and Sue McMandel. Um, if you look at the classical risk curve, you see this, you kind of move from underfitting to underfitting, and where does it end? It ends at the point when the training risk becomes zero. But what if you could continue? beyond the zero loss. Well, of course, you cannot, loss cannot be smaller than zero. It's a square, it's some function which is positive. But you can increase the model complexity even further. And in fact, with neural network, that was done routinely. And it turns out that when you uh, actually increase the model complexity beyond the interpolation threshold, that's what we call this, uh, you get this double descent. And um, the reason to call it double descent is because you have this first descent stage, the classical descent, and then the risk drops yet again, and this is this modern interpolating kind of regime. You have the second descent. Now, every classifier here is, or every regret predictor here is interpolating. It has zero loss, 
But as the complexity of the space increases, you actually have decreasing and potentially indefinitely decreasing risk. By indefinitely, of course, it doesn't go to zero, but it asymptotes to some value here. In some cases, well, in practice, it seems to do that. There, there, there are some subtleties, but uh, it seems to most cases asymptote. And in most cases, that this regime, at least in practice, is below that one. But we can construct artificial examples when it goes either way. It's not a <coughs> law of nature. OK, well, let me give you some examples of this, just to convince you that this is a general phenomenon. And it goes beyond just the neural net. So we saw it in boosting, right? Very good. Yeah. So I think what for boosting we saw this kind of curve, but not. I don't think there was this one. Yeah. Yeah. So for boosting we saw that uh, even for neural network, even back like what Brian was asking, right? That's uh, that kind of that kind of this regime. It was observed probably twenty at, le at least more than twenty years ago. Um, but. Actually, we can observe this double descent curves for a lot of different models for fully connected network, random forest, for boosting, for um, you know, like random features of different kinds for simulated data. So it, it seems to be a very general, uh, quite general phenomenon. And uh, I should point out that uh, other researchers also observed this recently for neural nets. So, okay, well. But the question is, of course, well, it's not just to observe this, but the question is, what is the actually underlying mechanism? Why are we seeing this? And um, let me give you one example, which I think is quite useful, at least for me, to sort of illustrate this. This is a very simple model. It's just, so my data is one dimensional. It's just this red stars. And yeah, which is. So you're using L2 loss, and the way you're controlling the parameterization is you're fixing the number of trees and just operate. So first you build bigger trees. Once you hit zero loss, you start averaging the trees, because you cannot build bigger trees beyond zero. It's a little bit funny, but what we can discuss this later. It relates to, a, to actually a different point that somehow averaging does some sort of smoothing. But um, yeah, I don't know if you've seen this method PERT. It's very similar to that perfect ensembles of random trees. Some, someone suggested that. Uh, Cutler and Zhao, I think, from 2001. Maybe. Um, so, so let me point out what's happening here. Uh, so suppose, uh, so th this is, I think, 11 data points. Uh, I have 30 ReLU features. So these are just random ReLU features. It's a super simple neural network. I take random ReLU features, and I just fit them using linear regression. So there is nothing happening here. If I take 30 ReLU features, I get this quite awful jagged curve. When I take 300, it's much nicer and it's smooth. And when I take 3,000, it's essentially the same. It's kind of hard to see the difference. So you can imagine if I take 3 billion, it would look pretty much the same at this one. So you can see overparameterization doesn't hurt me at all here. Initially, it helps, and then it kind of saturates whatever it can help. It already helped here. So that's the kind of intuition. And let me make this intuition a little bit more precise with random Fourier features, with uh, Ali and Ben uh, proposed in 2007. Um, the idea is you take random Gaussian weights, and you construct a random embedding by taking in the product. So you x, you take in the product with this random Gaussian weights, and you take exponential. So it's a little bit strange as a neural net, but it makes perfect sense if you want to approximate a kernel, a uh, Gaussian kernel, because that's an approximation to a Gaussian kernel. And you can grow the number of random features indefinitely, of course. So let's see what's happening with random Fourier features. And the nice thing here is that we actually know what this limit is when the number of features goes to infinity. So initially, so this is the number of features times 1,000. So that's like 10,000, 20,000, and so on. Uh, I think th this is on Timit, actually, some data set. Uh, so initially, you go through this U-shaped curve. You get this interpolation peak. And at this point, your loss is 0, because the number of features is actually equals the number what you need to fit the data exactly. And then you have the second descent stage. And where does the second descent stage go? It actually asymptotes to this kernel machine. So you have infinite neural net, which is equivalent to a kernel machine. 
And the nice thing is that this kernel machine is actually the minimum norm solution for some functional optimization problem, which I'm, I don't want to discuss now. Um, so that means that why are we getting better results as we're increasing the number of features? What is happening here is that if I'm increasing the number of features, the norm initially increases, which is exactly what you expect here, and it hits a peak at this point. But then it starts to decrease. That's the norm of the solution. Why does it decrease? Well, very simple. Because at the limit, the norm of the solution actually is equal to the norm of the kernel machine. And this is what you can see here. And as I have more and more features, I have a bigger space of solutions which fits zero exactly. So I'm growing the space of possible functions or possible weights from which I can choose my minimum norm solution. And when it's large enough, it's basically enough to approximate this norm accurately. So that's why I get this big improvement initially. And then I kind of saturate because once the approximation is good enough, you don't get anything from extra features. That's the kind of mechanism underlying this. So more features is better approximation and, well, you know, the, the effect of that saturates. Now, um, if you look at that example that I had before, you can actually see that the norm is in, in decreasing here. It's 1,600 here, it's 400 and here, uh, like 413 here, it's 400. So it's um, consistent Should with push. that. This is for Relio, and that was for random Fourier, but it's the same phenomenon. Yeah. So question about your norm uh, graph that you were showing. Uh, so you're right, as, as the number of features increases, you can hope to approximate the kernel machine. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, but how do we expect to find such one? Like oh, in this case, because this is fixed first layer neural net, so we just solve linear regression. That's the beauty of it. Is that there is a unique solution, I just invert the matrix. Right, but should the best, should the, should the best linear best one-layer network actually be close to the minimum norm? Does it so the best neural network, yeah, so that's what you see, right? When I take enough features, the norm of my solution that I get is very close to the actual kernel machine. So I'm approximating it quite well with a large number of features, right? Of course, if I actually just want to do kernel machine, I don't need so many features. I can do it directly, but that's a separate issue. OK, um, now, uh, if infinite width optimal, well, we don't know this. We don't actually have any analysis on, of, for kernel machines. And may, maybe some of the Peter's analysis can actually, the, the analysis that Peter and collaborator did, uh, but maybe can help shed some light on this. But right now, we don't have any analysis of kernel machine for the noisy case. For the noiseless case, we can prove it. And basically, you, you can get a bound, which is kind of interesting. It's exponential in the number of data points. Um, you can say, okay, it's kind of limited, yes, but it's different from the bound that you get usually. Uh, now, uh, maybe I'll skip this point. It's not very important. Now, another way, you, so, so the, another way you can get, so you see when you minimize norms, that's essentially the same as maximizing some notion of functional smoothness. And another way to do it is to do it by averaging. And that's actually exactly what we do in those experiments. We take these interpolating trees and we average them. And the average of interpolating trees is better than any individual tree. So more smoothness always helps. So, all this, so you can average interpolating classifiers, get a new classifier with potentially better properties. All right, uh, linear regression, there is, uh, you, you can actually show it in some weak random feature models, and uh, there already have been some work on that. Uh, and, uh, now, um, how is this sort of, what's the philosophy of this? I would say this is a kind of different form of Occam's razor. The classically, in machine learning at least, the sort of idea of Occam's razor was, well, you're balancing the loss with some sort of measure of smoothness. Here, this is kind of a limit case of that. You're saying, I'm not going to worry about the loss at all. I'm only going to look at um, functions which fit the data exactly. So data is God-given. I'm not going to mess with it. Uh, now, 
in mowing the things which feed the data exactly, I'm going to choose something which is the smoothest, and I have some measure of smoothness. This measure of smoothness may be given by um, functional norm, maybe by some averaging or by some other process, like implicitly for like for neural networks with some sort of stochastic gradient descent or some other optimization. So there are all these different ways to enforce this belief, but it's enforced conditionally on fitting the data exactly. And uh, sort of one remarkable thing about kernel machine is actually all of the things coincide with um, averaging being an interpretation in terms of the Bayesian, um, the Bayesian sort of interpretation in terms of the Gaussian processes. All right, so um, let me uh, summarize the landscape of generalization. So you have kind of two different regimes, or at least that's what we believe now. Uh, there is this classical regime where classical bounds apply, and there is a modern interpolation regime where you get something based on this inductive biases of functional smoothness, and now we have some analysis. It's still kind of wide open, but we are starting to get some understanding of that. Yeah. So are you saying that there is not a third phase where when you increase the model, you know, significantly perhaps even more parameters, the test plus will go up? Usually not. And the, if you think about that uh, random ReLU features kind of example, you can see why you wouldn't expect that to happen. Because, well, if I have 3 million parameters or 3 billion parameters, it's the same thing. You're just going to get the same curve. However, you can, there are, you, you can have those. So if you just add noisy features, for example, you will see the third phase. So it's not impossible. In some models, it can appear. But we don't actually see it in any of the practical examples. <laughs> Question. So basically, this over, over parameterization, do you, have you been wise to put it in, weight, in the width? So only you, the width. So I am not, I am not touching depth at all here. Yeah, it's so only the width. Yeah. It would be a very different story, right? If you, have a, if you, if you put all the parameters in the, in the depth. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. yeah. This is explaining the width. The, the depth, I think, is a different mechanism, and I'm not going to touch it today. Yeah. So it may. Can you repeat it? Yeah. Uh, so the question is that there have been recently work showing that there are kind of when you train this neural network, there are some different regimes. Yeah. And for example, the regimes when the depth is not the sorry, the width is not infinite, may be different. Like this kernel and uh, I think you mean like this kernel and adaptive regime, for example, right? Yeah, so it may be, uh, we don't really have like a full understanding of where this lies. I believe that whenever you look at depth, you would, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> with, uh, you would see something like that. It's not depend, doesn't depend so much on the specific of the optimization. Like we see it with um, fully connected neural network, even with convolutional, you can see this. So I, I don't think that would, of course, the exact configuration of the curve will depend on various things. Uh, Okay, so um, now what is overfitting? I just need one to make one more point. Uh, so classically, we view overfitting is well, when the loss is small, right? We overfit, and what do we do when we overfit? We decrease the number of parameters, right, by doing some sort of shrinkage, whatever, some regularization, reducing the number of parameters, some procedure like that. Here, and this is the amazing thing, I think. Which sort of deep learning pointed out, is that overfitting really is a band of parameters. You can do classical regularization, but you can kind of do the opposite. You can increase the number of parameters and move right here, and that has the same effect. And that's, I think, is something new. OK, uh, let me. I'll skip this point. Um, let me just, OK, one, one quick point. When you look for the threshold, you have to take the number of classes. It's not the number of data points. It's the number of data points times the number of classes, at least for regression. And presumably for classification, it's not that different. Um, 
if you have image that that's one million times a thousand, it's one billion parameters you need to fit this exactly. <coughs> probably none of the current architectures have one billion parameters. So you're probably still in the classical regime. It's kind of close to the threshold, but not really on this side. If you train on something like CIFAR 10, you are well here. So I think it's important to keep this in mind that you may be observing different effects of regularization and other various you know, tricks that people use, depending on where you are, and it may not be completely obvious where you are in this landscape. Could you try the worst case condition? Like? It could be less, but it, in our experiments, it seems pretty <coughs> consistent with what you would expect. So, yeah, in principle, you can say, yeah, you can, it may be fewer than this. But I don't think, I don't think it's 100 million. Like, the biggest models have about 100 million, maybe, or something. I think it's more than that. It, at least there is, it seems plausible that it's hard to that. Yeah. I mean, that's the amount of data you need to fit random, completely random stuff of that size. I mean, it, Correct. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, you know, for specific things, you may see fewer. But, but you know, I, I think you still, I don't think you would expect to fit MNIST, uh, sorry, ImageNet with something like which has like 100 million parameters. Maybe, but it, it's marginal in any case. It's a delay. Excuse me, can you give a tra uh, intuition why this interpolation threshold is multiplied number of classes? By oh, because you, you have to, it's basically not just, imagine I have three classes, right? Then I have make three predictions. That's three times as many parameters essentially. Your output is multidimensional. You're predicting three things instead of one. If it's just binary classification, you can just view it as regression. So it's one parameter. But if you, you have to predict like, and so strictly speaking, this should be like number of classes minus one because you can add them all. Okay, let me, um, I'm running out of time. Let me uh, make a few points about uh, optimization. I don't really have time to go into it. But um, let, let me just make some couple of points here. So first, what is optimization on the interpolation? Um, if you look at the classical regime, you see that these things are highly non-convex. There are many local minima. Minima SGD actually doesn't converge if you fix the step size, right? It just oscillates. Now, in the modern regimes, every local minimum is global. There is a lot of work on this. When I say every, of course, you have to put the correct conditions, but just you know, informally. Uh, and um, what can be shown more uh, is that small batch SGD is extremely efficient. And in fact, it converges much faster than gradient descent. Uh, let me maybe just point out how this works. So this is what SGD looks like on the interpolation. So imagine I just have two data points. Each data point corresponds to this constraint. And now what is stochastic gradient descent? Stochastic gradient descent should really be viewed as some sort of partial Katzmark method. If you don't know what it is, it doesn't matter. You, you do the following. You start here. You take a projection onto the, it's alternating projections. You take the projection onto the first constraint. You don't complete it. That would be cut smarts to complete this. Then you take a step over this one, here, here, and so on. And you can see that if these two lines intersect, you actually have exponential convergence. That's basically what is happening. And of course, in practice, the things are nonlinear, and there are some, you know, many complications. But that's kind of the intuition why SGD is so efficient and in fact converges to zero loss. Uh, you can, uh, I'll skip this, to, uh, you can kind of analyze this in terms of the dependence on the step size, at least for you know, simple convex cases. And what you see actually is there is some sort of critical size when you increase your batch size, SGD grows up linearly, the efficiency of SGD, the step size that you can take, goes up linearly up to this, and then it kind of saturates. So for linear model, for convex settings, we can prove this. Um, mathematically, for neural networks, people have observed very similar things empirically. Uh, but there is a kind of um, implication of this, which is the following. Well, let's think about it. What is optimization in modern deep learning? Optimization in modern deep learning, you basically over-parameterize. That leads to interpolation. At least that's you know, maybe one view on optimization. Okay. Uh, interpolation results in fast stochastic gradient descent. And then you use a GPU to basically do that, because 
stochastic gradient descent and some sort of matrix multiplication <coughs> that's great on the GPU. Now let's just think how much computational gain you get. Well, if your critical step size, which I didn't define, but it's kind of the mini batch size for which you get full convergence rate, is 10, which happens in practice for some models. I, I had an example of that. Then uh, running SGD on GPU has computational ga gain of O of n divided by m star, when n is a data size, m star is a 10 number. And GPU, let's say, is 100 times faster than the CPU. So overall, for a million data points, you have a factor of acceleration of uh, 10 to the 7. Because you're 100,000 times faster based on your SGD, and you're 100 times faster based on the GPU over CPU. So that's a kind of uh, factor that we have. Uh, and that's a, that's a difference between um, a second and four months. That's a kind of acceleration that we can update. Yeah. Sorry, how can you assume that it's 100 times faster than CPU? The, the real number is like 2 to the 3. For What's that? So what, when you assume that it's 100 times faster? The uh, GPU is 100 times, well, maybe it's like 50 times. But it, it's roughly correct order of magnitude. It's not closer to 2 to the 3 if you assume server CPUs. I think these comparisons are usually with a CPU that's not a, you know. I it's OK. You, you know, OK, take, take it only like 10 times faster. You have a million times acceleration. It's still pretty good. Uh, just run it on, GP, on CPU. It's still 100,000. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, so maybe I just say one. Uh, OK, sorry, I'm over time. Uh, one thing you can learn from deep learning. You can actually, what? Oh, OK. Oh, wow, amazing. Oh, thank you. Uh, um, OK, we can actually learn from deep learning. Um, and in fact, we have an impl implementation of uh, this is with Sue and Mama, who just graduated. Um, what you can do is that if you try writing like some standard data set, not very large, on, li on say, CPU on LibSVM, you, it takes hours for something like 50,000 data points. If you use some of these tricks, which we basically learn from deep learning, you can reduce hours to seconds. So really, those things are something which we can actually use. And once we understand them, we can exploit and make even existing method much faster. All right. I am going to sort of two more slides with a kind of general summary. I would like to bring up some important points. Well, first, and this is kind of reflecting one of the points Peter made. Uh, the new phenomenon is interpolation. It's not over-parameterization. For example, classical methods like kernel machines or splines are infinitely over-parameterized. So there is not anything new about having a lot of parameters. Over-parameterization enables interpolation, but it's not sufficient as such because when you regularize, you kind of get rid of it, essentially. Two, empirical loss is a useful optimization target. In these settings, it should not be viewed as a meaningful statistic for the expected loss. It's just something else. <coughs> Three, uh, optimization is really quite different under interpolation. And in particular, SGD is overwhelmingly faster than GD. And finally, I would like to make the point that really understanding linear regression already gives you a lot of clues about what to expect. Not everything, of course, can be done using linear regression, but at the very least, as a sanity check, I think it's very important to understand what's true and what's not true for linear regression, certainly for me as far as it has been. So final slide. Um, here is a kind of summary picture. You have the classical regime where classical bounds apply. There are many local minima there, at least for neural networks and other kind of non-convex problems. SGD converges slowly, and you have to modulate the step size. Now, uh, if you want to choose the best classical model, you really have to be careful where it is. It's not, you have to hit the bottom of the skew. Modern machine learning, uh, kind of <coughs> generalization based on functional smoothness, optimization is easy. And every local minimum, well, essentially every local minimum is global. And SGD converges exponentially, and it converges much faster than gradient descent. So that's kind of the genius of deep learning, in the sense that you, know, you can take a very large model, and you get some sort of 
decent at least generalization and good optimization, and you get them for free. You just throw more parameters at the problem. It's really quite amazing. Oh, here is a collaborator, and thank you. Questions? A uh, quick question about this, where the threshold happens. Uh, so what would happen for, for regression problem? Do you have any insight here? So in all our experiment, regression was uh, for the threshold was actually very close to where you expect. Where you expect when the number of parameters is equal to the times the number of, uh, is equal to the number of data points times the number of classes. It seems to be pretty reasonable in practice. We did not use like hinge laws, so we usually tra train using L2 laws. If you use hinge laws or you know, one, some other laws, you would probably see that it's smaller than that. Right? At, le at least on easy problems, like something like MNIST, right? That's easy. You can probably get away with fewer parameters to fit it perfectly. But uh, in many of this, it seems pretty close to what you would expect, just by parameter counting. So I just want to point out that the complexity in terms of number of parameters is not always a good way to measure the really estimation complexity which is relevant to bias value freedom. For some cases, in a model, we can use a different measure, like big degree of freedom. You might remove it. Um, I don't think you would because um, the degrees of freedom, I mean, for, for linear models, we have this analysis. They basically work the same way. I think it really, uh, I mean, it. Yeah, I, I don't think, I think if you insist on interpolation and growing the model, then it would be very difficult to remove the, the peak. But of course, if you do some sort of regularization, you can remove it. The point is not always good to count the number of parameters as the de facto complexity. And we kind of went through that with boosting, right? People at the time was counting the number of iterations, and we realized that that was not the right measure of complexity. Well, that's the most natural one, right? For neural nets, that's what the one you have access to. Doesn't mean this is right. There's a lot of compression you can do. All the parameters are not independent. Yeah. So you can compress. Yeah, I, I mean, there are, I mean, it's like the bias variance trade-off itself, right? You would say bias variance trade-off has some measure of complexity, right? That's exactly the same, right? You, you don't necessarily, you, you can say, well, maybe you should measure it differently. It's some sort of, it's, it's what would you expect. It's a guide, right, this kind of curve. Okay. You got one more question? There was, yeah. um, so you have this picture of uh, you have this like, overfitting perfect fitting in the go down. What would you put regularization on um, this framework? Does it change the kernel in converge Q or how do you? Yeah, so if you add regularization, you can remove the peak. You wouldn't, uh, I mean, depending on the amount of regular, well, well, it depends on the amount of regularization. So if you regularize very lightly, you will just see a much smaller peak or maybe it will disappear depending on how much. Doesn't really affect very much the limiting case. If you regularize heavily, you can remove the peak completely and it would just look completely, you know, like decreasing. Uh, usually you suffer though, because that large model will not be as good if you regularize heavily. Um, so the things we can prove for mostly linear models for which you can actually analyze this exactly. Like other things we, I can tell you about empirical things. But it's simply empirical observation. So last question from this side. And your other part, you put the part N in the interpolating regime and the image net in the non interpolating regime. Yeah. And I wonder what you meant there exactly, because you can also train image net models so they get good test error about 100% training accuracy. Uh, very good. Yeah, so you really, when you say interpolation, really what I mean here is that you want to drive the, the model has to be large enough to drive the L2 error to zero. <coughs> and you probably can get something very similar with just looking at the classification error. 
but um, I suspect that it's not, so you can get close to 100% classification accuracy, but I suspect you cannot get very small L2 error with those things. I haven't checked. Maybe you can and maybe it is. I don't think people are trying. Yes. It's difficult, right? It's difficult. We have a, we have a homework. <laughs> okay, so we will now take lunch break. So we will meet here at 2.30 again for the afternoon. Thanks.